Hey, uh, well, welcome out. Um, I'm standing here in virtually an empty auditorium, yet thousands of you are joining at home, some in your living room, some snuggled up with kids, some in your bed, no judgment. Um, but I'm glad to hear because this is our new model of church. In fact, we've been doing this kind of church digitally for four weeks now. It's our fourth week in this, which means whether this is your first week or fourth week, this is your fourth week in kind of the stay at home initiative and you're doing it. I just strongly believe, I do, I strongly believe we as a church are gonna get through this and we're gonna come out stronger on the other side. Now, this is probably the portion of the service that you're going, I'm about positive that's not the guy from last week. And you'd be correct, that's Brad, or as I like to call him, Brad. Um, my name's Joel, I'm one of the other teaching pastors. If you're not kind of familiar with 242's model, is we have a rotating team of teaching pastors and that's on purpose because uh, we want to point you to fall in love with the person of Jesus, not with a personality. And so I'm glad to be here with you today uh, as we dig into this, glad to have you uh, out. We're in this series calling Unprecedented. Now, I had to Google what unprecedented meant and uh, it means uncertain or just unknown. And that's basically what this entire pandemic is. Um, it reminds me of these workouts my wife and I have been doing on demand. That's where we're at in the Fireball household. That, that's kind of how bored we are. We're doing workouts on the TV, which is something that televisions were never intended to do. But, but we'll do these, we'll pop on, and uh, there'll be this kind of like six pack guy or girl on the screen, and, and they'll just yell at you for 30 minutes. And every time I look at them and I say, there's no way they work out 30 minutes a day. They work out hours. And they yell at you and they even break it down more into one minute increments. And I'll be doing this kind of one minute workout and uh, we'll get to a point where I just can't really get through it. I don't know how many seconds is left. So do you know what I do? I give up. However, when this person gets on the screen and they yell at me, 10 more seconds, I say, I could do 10 more seconds. And this is what we all wish we had. We want someone to step on a screen, maybe it's this screen, maybe that's why you came here, and say, hey, this is how many more seconds you have left in this pandemic. You can get through this and you'd go, okay, I can do that. You've got 10 more days, I can do 10 more days, but can I be real with you? We don't have those answers. I don't know how long this will go on for. I don't know if your trip will get canceled. I don't know if your wedding will get canceled. I, I don't know if this will impact your senior year. My heart breaks for all of you college and high school students that it's your senior year and, and you don't have that closure with, with your athletic team or, or with your people. I, I don't know how long this will go. I don't know what this will impact. I, I don't know what this will impact for your family. But I'm gonna be honest with you, that's what is so unprecedented about it. But that's why we're doing this series because we want you to know that although we don't have those answers, we're gonna be a church that's not just with you on the other side. We're gonna be a church that's with you in the unknown. We're gonna be with you in the messy middle, the anxious nights that, that you have all these thoughts going on. We want to be here because we serve a God. I serve a God who's always been with me in my unknown. And we want to step forward and just be a glimpse of his light during this unprecedented time. In fact, we actually have hundreds of stories over thousands of years where there was many unprecedented times and our God remained consistent. In fact, our God was with them throughout it. In fact, let me just show you Romans 5, 3, one of my favorite verses because it talks about really unprecedented times. It talks about suffering and here's what the promise we get from scripture. It says suffering, actually produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character hope. And so if you are looking for some hope today, it's going to come through the messy, unprecedented middle. In fact, I really wanna dig into one of the most unprecedented time we have in all of scripture. And it's the story of a man named Job. Job, it's actually the oldest book we have recorded in our Bibles. Now, we actually did a series on Job two or three years ago, but his story, his message of the story of Job, it speaks completely differently 
in this unprecedented time. Now, we'll pick up in chapter 23 if you wanna turn there, but while you're turning there, let me kind of set the stage of what's happening in the life of Job. Because really this conversation begins not with Job, it's behind the curtain between God and Satan. And they're having a conversation and, and Satan is asking if he can bring this pain on, on, on Job's life, which first of all shows me that even the enemy has to ask permission. That's how big of a God we serve, but that's a, that's a different message. I'll get you that in the, in the future. Um, what I see here is, that's interesting is God says yes. Now, this doesn't make any sense. This would be like a thief going into a jewelry shop and just stealing diamonds and the owner coming out and saying, excuse me, thief, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm stealing your diamonds. And he said, oh, have you seen the biggest one? Here's the key. I mean, Job is known as one of the most faithful servants in God's letting Satan have him suffer. The, the only logical answer here is that Satan is being set up. In fact, the only logical answer here is that what the enemy meant for evil, God is gonna use for good. It's the story of Job and I believe it's our story during this time. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna dig into the story of Job. We're gonna see these links between pain, pain and blessing. Now, let me just tell you the pain Job's going through. Let me see if you relate with any of this. Uh, the first pain Job's going through is emotional pain. The first thing that happens is Job loses 10 children. And I know some of you during this pandemic, this is the pain, unfortunately, that you resonate with. You've lost a family member, or, or it's not even that you've lost someone or know someone that has lost someone. You know someone that's at risk and you can't be with them and you are in emotional pain right now. I know the second pain Job goes through is also hitting home during this crisis. It's financial pain. Job loses it all. And, and to those of you that have lost your income, part of your income or all of your income during this time, I, I sympathize with you. I am, I am so sorry, but I know God's with you in the middle of this even financial pain. The third type of pain we see Job go through is relational pain. You see, Job is staying faithful during all this, but his wife comes into the picture and she tells him, Job, you curse God and die. That's the exact quote from the book of Job. And I like to give her a little bit of slack because she's also just lost everything. She's lost her kids and her finances. And I know if that's happened in your life, there's probably relational pain or maybe it's just all this close quarters together. That's the pain is your relationships and your family or, or those living with you right now. Fourth type of pain for Job is physical pain. He actually gets boils from the bottom of his feet all the way to the top of his head. And I know that this disease specifically, COVID-19, it's physically painful. And, and beyond that, I have recently heard that we are one of the primary live streams for church in the University of Michigan hospital. And so I know some of you watching right now are in hospital beds unrelated to this pandemic, but in immense physical pain. And you need to hear that, that God's seen people through this before. And he is involved in your pain in this way as well. And the fifth pain Job's going through, if there was even any left, is spiritual pain. You see, Job's got three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, really good uh, children name on the other side of all this. And, and half of the book of Job is about Job's relationship with these three friends. You see, they come to him and they start attacking Job spiritually. They start telling him this simple fact. They say good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So Job, if this sin is happening to you or if this is happening to you in your life, you must have sin in your life. You must be a bad person. Now, let me just tell you that nowhere in scripture does it actually say that. In fact, God actually promises us, promises us that we as Christians, we will suffer. And suffering, you know what it will do? What I told you earlier, it will produce perseverance, which will produce character, which will actually produce hope. And so they start attacking him spiritually, but we know something bigger is happening behind the scenes. But I know that last one, if you didn't resonate with the fourth one is where you are. God, where are you in this? Where are you with my family? You're on your knees wondering what's happening with God. And I think what you need to see, what you need to be reminded today is the same thing Job did. That ultimately his pain led to blessing that God could be doing something in the middle of this. In fact, what the enemy meant for evil that our God could use for good. Hey, pick up with me in the book of Job. If you turn there already, chapter 23, uh, we'll start in verse uh, 10. It says this right here. Job uses some imagery here. He said, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Now, he uses the imagery of gold. I don't know a lot about gold, probably because I don't have a lot of gold, 
But what I do know about gold is it has to go through fire. It has to go through fire to become the precious valuable element that it is. And Job is referring to himself as gold. He's saying, hey, this suffering is actually growing me in insane ways. Here's the first link I see between pain and blessing. The first link is suffering to strength. Now, I know many of you know this because I've had coffee with many of you and you've told me about the ways you've suffered. And almost the consensus with all of this, all of your stories, is that your suffering, you would not wish on anybody. However, you would do it again. You would go through it again. Why? Because it made you who you are. So many of you strong women and men of God are watching right now and you are strong because you've suffered. Kelly Clarkson, the theologian says, what doesn't kill you, right, makes you stronger. But there really is a link between suffering and strength. And during this time, we're suffering. We're in some pain, but let me tell you, in fact, let me illustrate how I think this will actually make you stronger. Let let me do it by showing you this logo right here. Uh, This is the FedEx logo, a logo you've probably seen thousands of times during this pandemic, just driving by your house as we're all online bin shopping during this. And what you may have never noticed about this logo, it's pretty simple. It's the arrow in between the E and the X. We're gonna leave it up there. Right in between the white space between the E and the X is a logo, it's an arrow. Bah, just did a magic trick in your living room. Now, you've seen this logo thousands of times and possibly never noticed this. What's always been right in front of you has never revealed itself, but here's what I can promise you. Now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Here's my Joel Fireball guarantee to you. Next time it drives by your house, you're gonna go to a family member. Hey, do you see the logo between the E and the X? Because it's always been there, but now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. This is what's happening with our pain. I'm I'm telling you, there was pain that we were walking through before this, but we were good at covering. I mean, it was right in front of us, but we were able to out busy our pain. We were able to out notice our pain. And now we're kind of having to slow down and things that were always there, always right in front of us are now revealing themselves. I know in the Fireball household, for me, my wife has informed me that she has recently noticed I'm the world's loudest chewer. Didn't know this before, but now that I've seen it, or I guess now that I've heard it, I can't unhear it. And I apologize to all of you that I've had coffee or lunch with and chewed extremely loud. And I'm sure you've had little ones like that. Now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it, but you've also had bigger ones. Possibly it's with your finances. Uh, You weren't great at budgeting. You were living paycheck by paycheck, but it didn't really matter. But, But now that this financial crisis has hit, something that was always right in front of you, now you're seeing, it's glaring at you. Now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And guess what? Maybe it's gonna tighten our budgets through this. Maybe it's your kids. Uh, You're looking around and you're going, who raised these things? Because they weren't with you 24 seven. And there's possible issues in your kids or your relationship with your kids that now that you're with, you're seeing, they've always been there, but now that they're right in front of you, you're seeing them and you can't unsee it. And guess what? I think we're gonna work through them and have healthier family relationships on the other side of this. Or I don't even have to go that far to say, maybe it's your relationship. Maybe it's your marriage. Uh, whoever you're in close quarters with, that there was pain before this in that relationship, but you could disguise it or you could outbusy it. But now that you're spending a lot of time with this person or with these people, you can't swipe it under the rug anymore. And it's right in front of you. It's always been there. But now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And I believe we're gonna see marriages work through some of this pain and we're gonna see stronger marriages on the other side. I believe our church is seeing things that were right in front of us that we'd never seen. Ways we can help our community that were right there that we never noticed. And I believe on the other side of this, the link between suffering and strength is gonna be a church, God's church, stronger than ever before. And this is what Job's saying. Hey, I'm gonna come forth as gold in this. Well, it's God's turn to to start talking in uh, the Bible. And so he starts talking to Job. Talking is hard, as you can tell right now that I'm doing. If you turn to chapter 38, uh, your section probably says the Lord speaks and he starts talking to Job, but I wanna be clear, God didn't take away Job's pain. His pain is still there. I mean, he still has physical boils and emotional loss and he starts talking to Job, but he does something interesting. He starts talking about ostriches and planets. Check this out, we'll pick up 38 verse four. 
Job, God says to Job, uh, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? In other words, Job, were you there when I built this earth? I, I didn't think so. He talks about the earth for a while uh, and then he goes down. He says, uh, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Job, have you ever been to the bottom of my ocean? Have you ever walked around uh, on the ocean that I designed so specifically? Have you done that, Job? I didn't think so. He goes up from there, starts talking about rain and snow. He says this right here. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? Rain fascinates me. Do you realize if it were to rain one inch, one inch over a square radius of our campuses, right from Saginaw to Monroe, that that would be millions and millions of tons of water. And God is saying to Job, hey Job, who makes millions of tons of water float in the air? Is it you or is it me? Here's what God's doing here. God didn't take away Job's pain. God just refocused where Job was looking. And he refocused where Job was looking from his pain to the glory of God, to how big and powerful our God is. God did not take away Job's pain. He refocused it to his glory. I mean, he goes up even higher, chapters and chapters. God just goes on and talks about the size and the power and the glory that our God holds. Check this out right here as he goes into the constellations even. He said this right here in verse 31. Can you bind the chains of Pallades? Can you loosen Orion's belt, right? Orion's belt, that's something we've seen through, through a telescope. Job would have only seen from the ground and God takes him into space. And, and, and there's a very important link here, a very important link here because watch Job's response. Job responds, it, it's fascinating. Chapters go by of God talking about his glory and Job responds by saying this right here in chapter 42. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He took his mind off of his pain and for the first time in his pain, experienced the power of God. Here's the link here. It's the link between power and praise. The link between the power of God and our response in praise. Now, we don't know if God like showed Job imagery or visions of this stuff, but with technology, I kind of can. Let me just show you a little bit of the power of our God. Uh, this first image right here, this is Jacob's well. I actually saw this image uh, on Instagram Go this week, or Planet Go on Instagram. Uh, this is the most dangerous underwater scuba diving cave. And this guy is just diving belly right at it. And I look at this and it terrifies me. I mean, this terrifies me to just imagine how deep that goes. And this is where God starts. Hey, have you ever walked on the bottom of my ocean, Job? Do you understand Jacob's well and, and how deep and dangerous that I designed every part of that? And then God goes up. Well, this next image I'm gonna show you, God didn't technically create, but I thought it was an important image uh, because I am praying for the big three so desperately during this time, especially as, as you make such an impact in, in the Michigan, the state we live in. Um, but it's also the Renaissance Center. It's GM's Renaissance Center. It's the tallest building in Michigan. 527 feet high, 555 feet high, if you include the point. I know if I didn't say that, UGM people, you would reach out to me. And, and here's the deal. I picture myself at the bottom of this looking up, all right? And I feel so small, but let me take you higher to something God did create. Because if I took 40 of these buildings and stacked them one by one on top of each other to get you five and a half miles in the sky, that would take you to the tallest mountain, Mount Everest. Here's a view from Mount Everest. You can't even see down because you're above the clouds. And our God breathed this into existence. This is the size of our God. I mean, he's massive. He's incredible. Remember lastly, God took him all the way to space. This is five and a half miles high. Let me take you 29,900 miles high. That's how high you have to get, not to space, but to be able to see our planet altogether. And our God created this. I mean, from here to the next star is 92 million miles. I can't physically show you how big and how powerful our God is, but I need you to know this planet you're looking at right now, he holds in his hands. He holds up with his pinky that our God has this global pandemic. And Job in the middle of his pain, what he does is he shows him how 
big he is and that he has him in the middle of it. But then God does something fascinating. You see, God goes from showing him how big he is. God goes from showing him what he can do to asking Job to go do something so seemingly small. He shows him how big he is, what only he can do, and then asks Job to go do something that only he can do. And it's how the book of Job ends. See, it's in the final chapter, and Job is with his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, just the crew is hanging out. And these friends have hurt Job. I mean, half of the book, they've attacked him spiritually. And so God says to Job, uh, if you want me to forgive them, what I need you to do, Job, is to pray for them. In the middle of Job's pain, God still has not taken it away. In the middle of his pain, he asks him to go restore a relationship with friends. And here's why I think he did this. I think God wanted to show him what he could do, but he wanted to show Job that he still has purpose even in his pain. I mean, maybe he couldn't have helped his friends financially during this, but he could pray for them. Maybe he couldn't have let them move into the extra room, but he could heal the relationship with them. He showed them what only he could do and then asked Job to go do what only he can do. And look at what happened right after verse 10. It said, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had had before. Twice the amount of cattle, twice the amount of children. Uh, I mean, after God showed him what he could do, then showed Job what he could do, God came with the restoration. Now, I wanna be clear because I told you earlier there's links between pain and blessing. This is not the blessing. I, I wish I could tell you if you stay faithful, you're gonna make twice as much on the other end of this. I, I, maybe a stimulus check, but that's not the blessing, right? The blessing comes, the word we see blessed is actually in verse 42, two verses later, right towards the end of the book where it says the Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the former part. The blessing came after the trial, after the pain. That means his wife's relationship was twice as strong on the other side of this. He got to see twice as many children and he had a new kind of uh, just confidence as he raised them. Uh, the link I see here is, is so, so neat because it had to come through pain. The link I see here is Job's pain to his purpose, right? God, God looked at Job, said, I'm gonna show you how big I am. I'm gonna show you what only I can do, but I'm gonna call you to go do what only you can do. Job, in the middle of your pain, you still have a purpose. So let me summarize the story of Job. This man's in immense pain. The enemy thinks he's gonna use it for evil. And, and all that happens, God doesn't take away the pain. He's going through this pain. Instead, God refocuses Job's focus to show him how big he is. Jo God shows Job what only he can do. And then he calls Job to go and do what only he can do. And what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. I believe this is our story. I believe the enemy thinks he can use this for evil, but I believe we're gonna see close-knit families we're gonna see a closer church. We're gonna see a more powerful mission. We're gonna see the gospel spread. We are gonna see what the enemy meant for evil. We're gonna see God use it for good. We are gonna see links between pain and blessing. But here's how I think this happens. It's the same way it happened with Job. I think it's gonna be us looking up and realizing that God's gonna do what only God can do, that he holds this planet in his hand, but it's gonna still take us doing what only we can do. Maybe you're sitting there saying, okay, I don't know what that is for me. I'm quarantined in my home and I want you to stay safe. So let me give you some examples of God's church already doing this. This first picture right here, this is Randy. Randy's from our Lansing campus and Randy's into 3D printing. And uh, Randy, as he 3D, we'll throw the 3D printer up there. And yeah, he, this is his 3D printer. I'd never seen one. Well, he got with some friends at Tinker Labs and found out he could print the masks that hospitals are out of, N95 mask. Here's a picture of that mask. And he's printing with some friends upward of thousands of these masks to deliver to hospitals. Now, why would Randy do this? Because Randy's, Randy's a believer in Jesus and he knows God's gonna do what only God can do. And Randy, he's gonna do what only Randy can do. Let me show you this picture right here. This is Paula. Uh, Paula's from our Brighton campus. And during all this, her TV went out. Can you imagine? And so she obviously had to call and she was telling me the story. And she said, honestly, when I called, I was frustrated which of course I would be too. And so she's on the phone, but she starts to hear the person she's talking with, their kind of pain. And she realizes the lady she's talking with is in the call center in the Philippines, hasn't seen her family in weeks. And so Paula takes 20 minutes out of her day to listen to this lady's story and pray with her 
over the phone. And since then, Paula's just been calling random companies, calling random people and praying for them. She's been using her gift of being an extrovert from home. Why is Paula doing this? Because she knows God's gonna do what God can do, but Paula's gonna do what Paula can do. Let me show you this next image right here. Uh, This is the Hill family. They're from our Lansing campus and uh, they're safe quarantined at home, but they have a friend who's on the front line. They work in the medical field. And let me just say, to all of you from the bottom of our church's heart and from my church, to all of you on the front line, doctors, nurses, uh, I know anyone in the medical field, policemen, firemen, thank you so much for what you're doing. Because the Hill family, what they realized is although they're not going in, they know someone who is, and so they sent care packages in to these hospitals for these nurses, but, but that's not even the cool part. The cool part is the note they sent with it. Uh, The note starts, you can take a picture on your screen if you wanna read the whole thing, but it starts with thank you, thank you, thank you. And it ends with Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They are ministering to the front line during this. Why? Because God's gonna do what God can do, but the Hill family, they're gonna do what the Hill family can do. Let me show you another one. This is Jasmine and Abby right here. They are also from our Lansing campus. Lansing, you're taking over Michigan. I don't know what you're doing, but but let me share Jasmine and Abby's story. Uh, Jasmine heard of a need. It was a need, a lady who's sick, having trouble paying some bills, some medicine, and even dog food, and we love our pets. And uh, so she got together with her small group. Here's her small group, and uh, they got together $300. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like a lot of money. During this time, it is, and it changed this lady's life, right? This is God doing the big stuff and calling us to do the small stuff. For Job, it was praying for his friend, but, but here's the cool part. That's what Jasmine did. Abby wanted to get involved. She thought maybe this lady needed more than money. Maybe she needed one of her pictures. So God could do what only God could do. But Abby, she's gonna do what only Abby can do. Let me share one last one with you. This is from our Livonia campus. This is Libby and Andrew right here. Uh, Andrew actually got baptized one of the days I was there. Hey, I'm thinking of you, Andrew. Um, They heard of a 90-year-old lady who was supposed to have a big birthday party because that's such a bash, right? That's such an accomplishment. All her family's coming in. But if I can just be real with you, We know all of our elderly friends, even you watching how at risk you are. And so she couldn't have any of her family during this. She is in complete isolation during all of this. Can't see any of her family during the 90th birthday party. So what did Libby and Andrew do? They they threw her a birthday party. Now it looks a little different as you can see. It's letters and notes and cards, but it changed this lady's life during this time something that she thought she couldn't have, Andrew and Libby provided for her. Why? Because God's gonna do what God's gonna do. He holds this world in our hands, but we're called to do what only we can do. And so let me ask you during this time, are you looking in and getting stressed? Are are you looking out at the news? Or are you going and doing what what only you can do? Now, I I wanna be clear as we link these things. I'm not telling you to not watch the news, right? As we look to the glory of God, what he can do, and then we go and do what we can do. I'm just telling you before you watch the news, have a worship session in your room dancing around and tell me when you turn on the news, if that doesn't change your perspective. I'm not telling you to not get caught up and read articles. All I'm telling you is open your Bibles, see how big the God we serve is, and then step into these articles and tell me if that doesn't give you a peace. Because I don't believe our goal in this is to look out right now or to look even within, it's to look up, to see how big our God is, to see what only he can do, that he has this pandemic, this unprecedented time, and then for us to go do what only we can do. So let me ask you, what can only you do? What can only you do during this time? Maybe you don't have the finances and it's calls and praying for people. Maybe it's a bin out front of your house with supplies saying, take what you need. Maybe it's writing a letter to to a family friend or someone on the front lines, or maybe it's even mending a relationship. That's what God had Job do during this time. Seemingly small, but right now, exactly probably what we need to hear in this unprecedented time. That listen, just because we're losing our patience does not mean we've lost our purpose. I'm telling you, church, I cannot believe on the other side of this when this is just a story that that we want our purpose during it to be how many Netflix shows we watched or how many puzzles we put together. I believe God's church is on mission now more than ever. 
and I'm tired of Satan using the lie that that's too small, so I'm not gonna do anything. Listen, God's gonna do what God's gonna do. But I'm telling you, church, we're gonna step up as more than ever and do what only we can do. So what can you only do? In fact, as I was watching this and preparing for this and reading the story of Job, God got me, what can Joel only do? What, what can Joel only do? I know my platform's different than everyone. Right now, I know about 25,000 people are joining online. And at least during this moment, what I can do is I can introduce you to something that has changed my life. And honestly, it's something way more drastic than the coronavirus. There's a problem out there way more drastic than the coronavirus and it's sin. I'm telling you, we brought it into this COVID-19 pandemic and it's gonna go with us on the other side. In fact, it's gonna impact eternity. But God sent his son to this earth to conquer that sin. If you don't know the story of Jesus, he came to this earth, righteousness and sandals, right? God in a bod. He lived 30 years of perfection and then went to this rugged cross. He got a crown of thorns shoved on his head as he was mocked during this time. And we're gonna talk about this next week in our Easter message. But what was happening here was our sin was going on his back. This pandemic, the real pandemic, sin was going on his shoulders. It was so bad, God could not even look at his son. But thankfully with three final words in English, one in Greek, it is finished, something happened. And all of a sudden, our sin went on his shoulders, but his past, those 30 years of, perf of perfection came to his children, came to any one of us who put our faith, put our confidence in him. And if you're watching right now and have never put your confidence in him, what this means is that everything we've done, everything we've said, our past, we no longer have to look at what we've done. We get to look at what he's done. We get to look at the empty grave. He's conquered the hill of Calvary, the cross. He's conquered. We don't have to look at our past. We get to look at his past. And I'm telling you right now, I, I'm, this is what I can do. And, and so if you're watching and you've never put your faith in Christ, now's the time. Now's the time to get right with God. Now's the time to look at his son, Jesus, and realize that that is where life and peace will be in the middle of the unprecedented time. In fact, you can click a button on church online and our pastors will get to you or comment on Facebook. But, but also, because it's not just about doing what's big, it's about doing what's small. Here's my email. This is how God was speaking to me this week. I'm just telling you, I'm being 100% honest. Is that maybe this week, I just need to answer 35,000 emails. So, so if, if you have a question about Jesus or you wanna talk about Jesus, will you email me? I, I will answer every single email or, or point you to a pastor that does be, because it's what I can do. I, I can do that from my home and I can talk to you about Jesus. And this could not just change COVID-19. It could not just change this pandemic. It could change your life like it's changed mine. But if you're here and you've experienced Jesus, then it's time we look to that glory. It's time we look to him and what only he can do. And then we can step out as a church and do what only we can do. And I believe, although our church doors are shut and closed, we are gonna explode as the church of Christ in ways we never have before. One story, one moment, one small gesture at a time as we go and be the church of Christ that even the gates of hell can't stop. God's gonna do what only he can do. How can you do what only you can do?